Chapter 3 It seemed like the middle of the night. Someone was calling me, waking me up. What did they want? Suddenly, I was aware of all kinds of activity. Police. The crackling of walkie-talkies. The place was buzzing. Here, put this on, one of them said, handing me a bathrobe. What's going on? I asked. You're being moved. Where am I being moved to? You'll find out when you get there. A wheelchair was waiting. I figured they were taking me to jail. There was a caravan of police cars outside the hospital. It looked like I was going to be in a parade again. The ride was pleasant. Just looking at houses and trees and people passing by in cars was good. We arrived at the prison at sunrise, in the middle of nowhere. It was an ugly, two-story brick building. They pushed me up the stairs to the second floor. I was put in a cell with two doors. A door of bars was on the inside, and directly outside of that was a heavy metal door with a tiny peephole that I could barely see through. The cell contained a cot with a rough green blanket on it and a dirty white wooden bench with a hundred names scratched on it. Adjacent to the cell was the bathroom, with a sink, a toilet, and a shower. Hanging above the sink was the bottom of a pot or pan. It was supposed to serve as a mirror, but I could barely see myself in it. There was one window covered by three thick metal screens facing a parking lot, a field, and in the distance, a wooded area. I walked around the cell, to the bath, to the window, to the door, back and forth until I had tired myself out. I was still pretty weak. Then I lay down on the cot and wondered what this place was going to be like. Here I was, my first day in prison. In about an hour, a guard unlocked the outside door and asked me if I wanted breakfast. I said, yes. And in a few minutes, she came back with eggs and bread in a plastic bowl and a metal cup containing something that was supposed to be coffee. The eggs didn't taste too bad. Maybe prison food isn't as bad as they say it is, I remember thinking. I heard voices, and it was clear they weren't police voices. Then the radio came on. Black music. It sounded so good. I looked through the peephole and saw faces. Weird and distorted because of the concave glass, but black faces to match the black voices I had heard. How y'all doing? I asked. No response. Then I realized how thick the metal door was, so I shouted this time. How y'all doing? A chorus of muffled fines came back. I was feeling good. Real people were just on the other side of the wall. The guard opened the metal door and handed me some uniforms. Maid's uniforms, royal blue, white buttons, collars, and cuffs. I kept trying them on until two of them fit. Then she gave me a huge cotton slip that looked like a tent dress and a nightgown that looked exactly like the slip. You are entitled to a clean uniform once a week. Once a week, I nearly screeched. They had to be crazy. Behind the guard, 
Through the open door, I could see some of the women standing around. They were all, it seemed, black. They smiled and waved at me. It was so good to see them. It was like a piece of home. When are you going to unlock me and let me go out there? I asked, motioning to the other women. The guard looked surprised. I don't know. You'll have to ask the warden. Well, when can I see the warden? I pushed. I don't know. Well, why am I being locked in here? Why can't I go out there with the other women? I don't know. Then why can't you let me out? We were told you were to remain in your room. Well, how long am I supposed to stay in here locked up like this? I don't know. I saw it was useless. Would you please tell the warden or the sheriff that I would like to see him? I requested. The guard locked the door and was gone. The metal door was unlocked again. An ugly, shriveled white woman stood in front of the bars. My name is Mrs. Butterworth, and I am the warden of the women's section of the workhouse. She reminded me of a dilapidated horse. Well, Joanne, is there something I can do for you? I didn't like her looks or her tone of voice, but I decided to ignore that for the moment and get to the business at hand. When can I be unlocked from this cell and go outside in the big room with the other women? Well, I don't know, Joanne. Why do you want to go out there? Well, I don't want to stay in here all day locked up by myself. Why, Joanne, don't you like your room? It's a very nice room. We had it painted just for you. That's not the point, I said. I would like to know when I will be able to be with the other women. Well, Joanne, I don't know when you'll be able to come out. You see, we have to keep you in here for your own safety because there are threats on your life. You know, Joanne, she said, lowering her voice like she was speaking confidentially. Cop killers are not very popular in correctional institutions. Have any of the women here made threats against me? Well, I don't know, but I'm sure they have. I'll bet, I said to myself. Nobody has threatened my life. They just don't want to let me out of here. Well, Joanne, the important thing is for you to behave and to cooperate with us so that we'll be able to send a good report to the judge. It's important for our girls to behave like ladies. This woman was making me sick. Did she think I was fool enough to believe that either she or the judge was going to help me in any way? But it was the superior sounding tinge to her voice that really ticked me off. Butterworth, is it? I asked. What's your first name? Why, I never tell my girls my first name. I'm not one of your girls. I'm a grown woman. Why don't you tell people your first name? Are you ashamed of it? No, Joanne, I'm not ashamed of my name. It's a matter of respect. I am the warden here. My girls call me Mrs. Butterworth, and I call them by their first names. Well, you haven't done anything for me to respect you for. I give people respect only when they earn it. Since you won't tell me your first name, then I want you to call me by my last name. You can either call me Miss Shakur or Miss Chesimard. I'm not going to call you by your last name. I'm going to continue calling you Joanne. Well, that's okay by me, if you can stand me calling you Miss Bitch whenever I see you. 
I don't give anybody respect when they don't respect me. Lock the door, she told the guard and walked away. Days passed. Evelyn called the sheriff, the warden. There were two wardens in that jail, Butterworth and a man named Cahill. Cahill had all the power, though. Butterworth was only a figurehead. And everybody else. Nothing more could be done outside of going to court. I had little or no feeling in my right arm. I knew I needed physical therapy if I was ever to use it again. I had learned to write with my left hand, but that was no substitute. I needed a more specific diagnosis of exactly what had been damaged before I would know whether or not I would ever use it again. Even with physical therapy. Isolation was driving me up the walls. I needed materials to write and to draw, paint or sketch. All my requests went unheeded. I was permitted nothing, including peanut oil and a small ball to aid movement in my arm. When the jail doctor examined me, I asked him about my arm. Why, we doctors aren't gods, you know. There's nothing anyone can do when someone is paralyzed. But they said I might get better, I protested. Oh, yes. And the physical therapist at Roosevelt Hospital said that some peanut oil might help. Peanut oil, he asked, laughing. That's a good one. I can't write a prescription for that, now can I? My advice to you is to forget all about that stuff. You don't need any of it. Sometimes in life, we just have to accept the things that are unpleasant. You still have one good arm. I kept talking, but I could see I was wasting my time. He had no intention of even trying to help me. Well, would you at least prescribe some vitamin B? All right, but you really don't need it. Every time they called me to see the doctor after that, I went reluctantly. He would take my arm out of the sling and move it back and forth about two inches. Oh, yes, you're getting better, he would say. I always asked about physical therapy, and he always said there was nothing he could do. Finally, Evelyn went to court. Some of the items we petitioned for were ridiculous. In addition to physical therapy and nerve tests, we asked for peanut oil, a rubber ball, a rubber grip, books, and stuff to draw or paint with. The court finally granted a physical therapist if we would find one and pay the bill. But I never got one. It seems that no physical therapist in Middlesex County was willing to come to the prison to treat me, and only a physical therapist from Middlesex County was permitted. But I did get the peanut oil and the grip, and in a short time I had a whole physical therapy program worked out. I was receiving a lot of mail from all over the country. Most of it came from people I didn't know mostly militant black people, either in the streets or in prison. I got some hate mail, though, and some letters from religious people who were trying to save my soul. I wasn't able to answer all of those letters because the prison permitted us to write only two letters a week, subject to inspection and censorship by the pres prison authorities. It was hard for me to write anyway, I was also very paranoid about letters. I could not bear the thought of the police, FBI, guards, whoever, reading my letters and getting daily insight on how I was feeling and thinking. But I would like to offer my sincerest apology to those who were kind enough to write me over the years and to receive no answer. I spent my first month at the Middlesex County work house writing. 
Evelyn had bought some newspaper clippings, and it was obvious the press was trying to railroad me, to make me seem like a monster. According to them, I was a common criminal, just going around shooting down cops for the hell of it. I had to make a statement. I had to talk to my people and let them know what I was about, where I was really coming from. The statement seemed to take forever to write. I wanted to make a tape of it and enlisted Evelyn's help. As my lawyer, she was dead set against it and advised me not to make the tape. But as a black woman living in America, Evelyn understood why it was important and necessary. When the prosecutor found out about the tape, he tried to get her thrown off the case. She was ordered by the court never to bring a tape recorder again when she visited me. I made the tape of To My People on July 4th, 1973, and it was broadcast on many radio stations. Here is what I said. Black brothers, black sisters, I want you to know that I love you. And I hope that somewhere in your hearts, you have love for me. My name is Asada Shakur. Slave name, Joanne Chesimard. And I am a revolutionary. A black revolutionary. By that, I mean that I have declared war on all forces that have raped our women, castrated our men, and kept our babies empty-bellied. I have declared war on the rich who prosper on our poverty, the politicians who lie to us with smiling faces, and all the mindless, heartless robots who protect them and their property. I am a black revolutionary, and as such, I am a victim of all the wrath, hatred, and slander that America is capable of. Like all other black revolutionaries, America is trying to lynch me. I am a black revolutionary woman. And because of this, I have been charged with and accused of every alleged crime in which a woman was believed to have participated. The alleged crimes in which only men were supposedly involved, I have been accused of planning. They have plastered pictures alleged to be me in post offices, airports, hotels, police cars subways, banks, television, and newspapers. They have offered over $50,000 in rewards for my capture, and they have issued orders to shoot on sight and shoot to kill. I am a black revolutionary, and by definition, that makes me a part of the Black Liberation Army. The pigs have used their newspapers and TVs to paint the Black Liberation Army as vicious, brutal, mad dog criminals. They have called us gangsters and gun moles and have compared us to such characters as John Dillinger and Ma Barker. It should be clear. It must be clear to anyone who can think, see, or hear that we are the victims. The victims and not the criminals. It should also be clear to us by now who the real criminals are. Nixon and his crime partners have murdered hundreds of third world brothers and sisters in Vietnam, Cambodia, Mozambique, Angola, and South Africa. As was proved by Watergate, the top law enforcement officials in this country are a lying bunch of criminals. The president, two attorney generals, 
the head of the FBI, the head of the CIA, and half the White House staff have been implicated in the Watergate crimes. They call us murderers, but we did not murder over 250 unarmed black men, women, and children, or wound thousands of others in the riots they provoked during the 60s. The rulers of this country have always considered their property more important than our lives. They call us murderers, but we were not responsible for the 28 brother inmates and nine hostages murdered at Attica. They call us murderers, but we did not murder and wound over 30 unarmed black students at Jackson State or Southern State either. They call us murderers, but we did not murder Martin Luther King Jr., Emmett Till, Medgar Evans, Malcolm X, George Jackson, Nat Turner, James Cheney, and countless others. We did not murder by shooting in the back 16-year-old Rita Lloyd, 11-year-old Ricky Bodden, or 10-year-old Clifford Glover. They call us murderers, but we do not control or enforce a system of racism and oppression that systematically murders black and third world people. Although black people supposedly comprise about 15% of the total American population, at least 60% of murder victims are black. For every pig that is killed in the so-called line of duty, there are at least 50 black people murdered by the police. Black life expectancy is much lower than white, and they do their best to kill us before we are even born. We are burned alive in fire trap tenements. Our brothers and sisters OD daily from heroin and methadone. Our babies die from lead poisoning. Millions of black people have died as a result of indecent medical care. This is murder but they have got the gall to call us murderers. They call us kidnappers. Yet, Brother Clark Squire, who is accused, along with me, of murdering a New Jersey state trooper, was kidnapped on April 2, 1969, from our black community and held on $1 million ransom in the New York Panther 21 conspiracy case. He was acquitted on May 13, 1971, along with all the others. Of 156 counts of conspiracy by a jury that took less than two hours to deliberate. Brother Squire was innocent, yet he was kidnapped from his community and family. Over two years of his life was stolen, but they call us kidnappers. We did not kidnap the thousands of brothers and sisters held captive in America's concentration camps. 90% of the prison population in this country are black and third world people who can afford neither bail nor lawyers. They call us thieves and bandits. They say we steal. But it was not we who stole millions of black people from the continent of Africa. We were robbed of our language, of our gods, of our culture, of our human dignity, of our labor, and of our lives. They call us thieves, yet it is not we who rip off billions of dollars every year through tax evasions, illegal price fixing, embezzlement, consumer fraud, bribes, kickbacks, and swindles. They call us bandits. Yet every time most black people pick up our paychecks, we are being robbed. Every time we walk into a store in our neighborhood, we are being held up. And every time we pay our rent, the landlord sticks a gun into our ribs. They call us thieves, but we did not rob and murder millions of Indians by ripping off their homeland, then calling ourselves pioneers. They call us bandits, but it is not we 
who are robbing Africa, Asia, and Latin America of their natural resources and the freedom and freedom while the people who live there are sick and starving. The rulers of this country and their flunkies have committed some of the most brutal, vicious crimes in history. They are the bandits. They are the murderers. And they should be treated as such. These maniacs are not fit to judge me, Clark, or any other black person on trial in America. Black people should and inevitably must determine our destinies. Every revolution in history has been accomplished by actions, although words are necessary. We must create shields that protect us and spears that penetrate our enemies. Black people must learn how to struggle by struggling. We must learn by our mistakes. I want to apologize to you my Black brothers and sisters, for being on the New Jersey Turnpike. I should have known better. The Turnpike is a checkpoint where Black people are stopped, searched, harassed, and assaulted. Revolutionaries must never be in too much of a hurry or make careless decisions. He who runs when the sun is sleeping will stumble many times. Every time a black freedom fighter is murdered or captured, the pigs try to create the impression that they have quashed the movement, destroyed our forces, and put down the black revolution. The pigs also try to give the impression that five or ten guerrillas are responsible for every revolutionary action carried out in America. That is nonsense. That is absurd. Black revolutionaries do not drop from the moon. We are created by our conditions, shaped by our oppression. We are being manufactured in droves in the ghetto streets, places like Attica, San Quentin, Bedford Hills, Leavenworth, and Sing Sing. They are turning out thousands of us. Many jobless black veterans and welfare mothers are joining our ranks. Brothers and sisters from all walks of life who are tired of suffering passively make up the BLA. There is, and always will be, until every black man, woman, and child is free, a black liberation army. The main function of the black liberation army at this time is to create good examples to struggle for black freedom, and to prepare for the future. We must defend ourselves and let no one disrespect us. We must gain our liberation by any means necessary. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. In the spirit of Ronald Carter, William Christmas, Mark Clark, Mark Essex, Frank Heavyfield, Woody Changa, Olugbala Green, Fred Hampton, Phil Bobby Hutton, George Jackson, Jonathan Jackson, James McLean, Harold Russell, Zaid Malik Shakur, Anthony Kumu Lugbala White. We must fight on. The workhouse had a whole heap of rules, most of them stupid. No newspapers or magazines were permitted. When I asked why we couldn't read newspapers, they told me that newspapers were inflammatory. Obviously, if a person read in the paper that his or her sister had been raped, he would wait until the rapist came to jail and then do him bodily harm. But, I protested. The other inmates watched television and listened to the radio. 
I wasn't allowed either. They could receive the same information that way or from a visit from home. In that case, the warden told me, we don't let you read newspapers because they are a fire hazard. One of the saddest rules prohibited children from visiting their mothers in jail. I could see the children waiting outside, looking up at that ugly old building with sad, frustrated faces. Their mothers would run to the only window that faced the parking lot just to get a glimpse of their children. Yelling out of the window was a no-no. But once in a while, somebody would get carried away. Sometimes their frantic screams went unheard. Gradually, I began to know the women. They were all very kind to me and treated me like a sister. They laughed like hell when I told them that I was supposedly being protected from them. Those first days before I had really learned to maneuver with one hand, they did whatever they could to make things easier for me. They volunteered to iron my uniforms and sneak it and sneak them into the laundry to be washed more than once a week. When they told me their charges and the time they were doing, I couldn't believe it. Quite a few of them were doing time for the numbers either six months or a year. In New York, doing time for number running was practically unheard of. And it certainly didn't get six months or a year. Everybody in the world knows that the numbers business keeps the cops fat. These women hadn't hurt anybody or stolen anything, yet they were sitting in jail, probably busted by the same cops that they paid off. Their only crime was competing with the state lottery. Most of them had already been sentenced. If the sentence was less than a year, time was served in the county jail rather than in the state penitentiary. If I had expected to find so-called hardened criminals or big-time female gangsters or gun malls in the workhouse, I would have been sadly disappointed. The rest of the women who weren't doing time for the numbers were in for some form of petty theft, like shoplifting or passing bad checks. Most of those sisters were on welfare and all of them had been barely able to make ends meet. The courts had shown them no mercy. They brought in this sister shortly after I arrived, who was eight months pregnant and had been sentenced to a month for shoplifting something that cost less than $20. Later, a middle-aged sister began coming to the workhouse on weekends. She worked during the week and served her six-month sentence for drunken driving on weekends. Knowing that white women with the same charges would never have received such a sentence, I thought it was harsh. But I didn't realize how harsh until she told me that she had been arrested for drunken driving in the driveway of her own house. She hadn't even been on a public road. She also told me that the cops had arrested her because they didn't like the way she talked to them. In that jail, it was nothing to see a woman brought in all beat up. In some cases, the only charge was resisting arrest. A Puerto Rican sister was brought in one night. She had been so badly beaten by the police that the matron on duty didn't want to admit her. I don't want her dying on my shift, she kept saying. It was days before this sister was able to get out of bed. In spite of it all, those sisters kept the place jumping. They told all kinds of funny stories about their lives, things they had seen and experienced. Some had a natural knack for comedy. What amazed me was the way they told the saddest stories in the world and made everybody laugh about them. Girl, that nigga was always in my pocketbook stealing my money. 
and all he did with it was blow it at the racetracks. Girl, that man spent so much money on the racetracks, he made me wish I was a horse. One day I fixed his ass, though. I was sick and tired of his mess. Betcha he won't go in nobody's pocketbook no time soon. I put a mouse trap in that sucker. Girl, you should have heard that nigga howl. My husband and me, we used to fight like cats and dogs. And he was jealous as the day is long. Child, we went to the bar this one, this night and the nigga got all high and started thinking I was messing around with some dude at the bar. As soon as we got outside, boy, he jumped on me like a gorilla jumps on a banana. Don't you know that man hit me so hard he knocks my teeth straight out of my mouth? Now hold on a minute, I told that fool. We can fight later. I ain't got no another $400 to spend on no false teeth. Child, we was drunk as skunks down on our knees for about an hour looking for those teeth. And when that fool found them, he said the teeth jumped up and tried to bite him. Lord, child, that man is a fool. I could listen to those stories only when the outside door was open. During the day, they had a female sheriff's officer posted outside my cell. When she was there, the door usually stayed open. The whole time I was at the jail, I saw very few white women. The few who did come were there only a few hours a day or so before they were bailed out. There was one white woman who was busted on the turnpike with 50 pounds of reefer. Everyone waited to see what her bail would be. Then we found out she had been released on her own recognizance, that is, without bond. To be released on recognizance in the state of New Jersey, one of the requirements is Jersey residents. The woman lived in Vermont, but nobody was really shocked. She was white. I was going crazy in that little cell. The only time they let me out was for visits and to see the so-called doctor. I have always been an active and restless person, and being locked up in that little cage all day drove me wild. I needed to stretch my legs. I started to run around the cell. I would run in this tiny circle until I was exhausted. Two or three days after I started, the warden, Miss Bitch, accompanied by some male guards, visited me. We hear that you are running around your cell, she said. You will have to stop this activity at once. What? Why? Because you are disturbing the people downstairs. What people? There is an office underneath you, and you are disturbing the workers. Are you crazy? They'll just have to be disturbed. I don't run for that long anyhow. If you let me go out into the yard to exercise with the other women, I'll stop running around my cell. I order you to stop running around your room. I don't remember joining your army, I said. When I join your army, then you can order me around. She left in a huff and I kept on running. That was the end of that. I have to thank her, though. If she hadn't come and harassed me, I would have probably given up running around that tiny space in a few days. The food in the workhouse was horrible. Actually, it was disgusting. The food there is worse than the food in any jail that I have been in since. And that is quite an accomplishment. I would sit and wait for lunch or dinner, hungry as hell, and they would bring me some greenish-brown iridescent chunks floating around in a watery liquid. Liver stew, they called it, or some lamb fat floating around in some water, which was supposed to be lamb stew. 
And that nasty looking, foul smelling stuff tasted much worse than it looked. The place was infested with flies and so was the food. The only thing edible was eggs when they had them and mashed potatoes. The only thing edible was eggs when they had them and mashed potatoes. I lived off the nuts and candy I bought from the commissary and the fruit my family brought on visits. Every single day for one whole week, they brought us this nasty stuff that was supposed to be ravioli. Well, that was the last straw. We all decided to go on a food strike. I wrote a petition, which everybody signed, and we sent it down to the warden's office. Later, the warden agreed to discuss making the food more edible, but he refused to talk to me. He said the fact that I had referred to the food as slop showed I was unreasonable. The food was better for a few days, and then it returned to the same old nasty slop. The woman's sheriff officer who guarded me had to be the oldest dumb blonde alive. She played the part to a bust. She was nosy and was the world's biggest gossip. Every time she saw me, she smiled and pretended to be oh so friendly. One day, some workmen were drilling a big hole in the wall to install new electrical circuits. Of course, as soon as she came in, the nosy sheriff's officer began her questions. What are they building? I said, haven't you heard? Well, you know, they passed a special law and they're going to execute me. They're building the gas chamber now. Well, she said indignantly, well, nobody told me about it. And she rushed off to find out why no one had informed her. The lights were turned off every night at 10. I was lucky because there was a night switch that I controlled in the bathroom adjacent to my cell. I would move the cot so that I was in as much light as possible, and I would read way into the night. When I tired of reading, I turn off the light and look out the window. Outside, police patrolled the area. A lot of times, there were two police on foot who seemed to be standing around near the parking lot. They carried rifles and shotguns. One night, in my usual condition of boredom, while standing at the window and feeling mischievous, I cried out a bird-like sound in the shrillest voice I could muster. Eek! 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 The pigs started looking around like crazy. They jerked this way and that way, as if they thought someone was behind them. Again, I cried. Eek! Eek! Ooh! Ooh! This time, they really jumped around. You would have thought it was World War II, and the Japanese were two feet away. I waited a while. When they called down, calm down, in a voice even shriller than before, I cried, They pointed their guns and actually walked backward, prepared to fire at anything moving. Then, quite by accident, my metal cup fell to the floor. Well, in a second, they were down on the ground, crawling, holding their rifles. When I saw these fools crawling around on the ground like that, I just couldn't take it anymore. I laughed until I was sick. Great big, bad police crawling around, scared of their own shadows. Every once in a while, I tried it again with different police, and usually the results were similar, but it was never as good as that first night. Because I had a broken clavicle, I had to wear a figure eight brace around my shoulders. It was made of foam and cotton with a tiny belt buckle fastener in the back, about a half inch wide. 
One morning, as I was eating, the guard came in my cell and took it. You can't have this. Why? Because it contains metal, she replied. You can't have anything with metal on it. Now, there I was, sitting on a metal cot, drinking out of a metal cup, eating out of a metal bowl, and this policewoman was standing in my face telling me I couldn't have my brace because of this tiny metal buckle. I raised all the hell I could, but I saw that she was, like she said, like they all say, only following orders. If the prison doctor says you need it, you can have it back. As soon as Dr. Miller came into the workhouse, I asked to see him. Without the brace, my shoulder felt weak and fragile. I could barely hold myself up straight. Don't worry about that old brace, the doctor told me. You don't need that thing anyway. It was all I could do not to kick him in his groin. Luckily, later that week, the bone specialist came out from the hospital to see me. He was a very good doctor and a very kind man. He told the warden in no uncertain terms that I needed my brace, and without it, I could be disfigured. He gave me a lot of encouragement for my hand so that I could regain full use of it. Finally, they returned the brace. It was about that time that the miracle started. I was sure now that my hand was coming back to life. I was beginning to be able to tell it to do things and it would actually respond. Each little bit of progress was a miracle. Being able to touch my pinky with my thumb, to pick up a cup, to hold a pencil, to pinch myself, were feats that took days of practice and exercise to accomplish. And then the day came when I knew I was almost there. After months of trying, I could finally snap my fingers. Whenever anyone came to see me, I would show them my new talents. I felt like a little kid saying, look, mommy, see what I can do. Finally, a joint conference was arranged between Sandiata and me with Evelyn present. It took place at the workhouse. Sandiata was brought from the new Brunswick jail. I've never been happier to see anyone in my life. It was difficult to talk because the guards were practically sitting in our laps. I can't whisper for nothing, and Evelyn kept telling me to lower my voice. We talked about the case and decided that it was politically correct to be tried together. Just seeing Sandiata cooled me right out. I was feeling bad and I was real self-conscious about how I looked. I had broken out in a horrible rash from the prison soap and I looked like a lopsided scarecrow with bumps. There is something about Sandiata that exudes calm. From every part of his being, you can sense the presence of revolutionary spirit and fervor. And his love for black people is so intense that you can almost touch it and hold it in your hand. There's nothing put on about him. He is a real folksy kind of person. Every time I see him, he looks like he belongs on a porch somewhere down south, breathing in the summer air and bouncing babies off his knee. The truth of the matter is that Sandiata is country. He would deny it to the bitter end but he is show enough country. And when he laughs, that giggle laugh of his, it's like a trip to Texas in the backwoods. When the conference ended, I was a different person. I felt much stronger, and I didn't feel alone. I don't know when, but somewhere along the way, I started to collect the metal cups we were given to drink from. At first, I think it was just my slow way of drinking that caused the cups to accumulate. 
I was non, none too popular with the guards, especially the men. Most of them hadn't said boo to me and vice versa. But they hated my guts. To them, I was a cop killer, and they were cops. Something told me to be real careful. They had given me a little table to eat and write on. And at night, before I went to sleep, I pushed the table up next to the bars and stacked the cups precariously on top of it. The bars opened into the cell, and the slightest movement would send the whole stack of cups clanging to the floor. I would push the wooden bench behind the table. In that way, anyone who tried to come in would have to apply some real pressure. I went through this routine every night, feeling slightly foolish but compelled. One night, in the middle of the night, the cups came crashing down. I immediately awoke to find four or five male guards standing in the doorway of my cell. I screamed, What do you want? What are you doing in my cell? Loud enough for someone to hear me. The guards stood in the doorway like they didn't know what to do. Finally, one of them locked the door and said, We heard a noise and we came to investigate. We were just checking it out. They weren't even supposed to be in the women's section. The female guard on duty that night, the slimiest one in the prison, was nowhere in sight. After that, no matter what jail I was in, I always found some way to barricade my cell. In prisons, it is not at all uncommon to find a prisoner hanged or burned to death in his cell. No matter how suspicious the circumstances, these deaths are always ruled suicides. They are usually black inmates considered to be a threat to the orderly running of the prison. They are usually among the most politically aware and socially conscious inmates in the prison. When Ava came to the workhouse, it was something of an event. Usually, she occupied the cell I was in. The rest of the women were housed in two open dormitories. The guards didn't know what to do with her. She had been in that jail many times before, and she was known as a hail raiser. Everybody said she was crazy. My first encounter with Ava was when she came over to the bars and sat down outside my cell and told me she could astro travel. She called it something like astro space projection. I can go anywhere I want to, whenever I want to, she told me. I've just come from Jupiter. How was it? I asked her. Oh, it was fine. They had these cute little people. They were purple with crocodile skin and blue hair. You can go anywhere you want to she told me. You just have to project yourself. Can you show me how to project myself the hell out of here? Oh, that's easy, she said. I do that all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm not here now. No, I said. That's not good enough. I want to project my mind and my body out of here. You'll be in jail wherever you go, Ava said. You have a point there, I told her, but I'd rather be in a minimum security prison or on the streets than in the maximum security prison in here. The only difference between here and the streets is that one is maximum security and the other is minimum security. The police patrol our communities just like the guards patrol here. I don't have the faintest idea how it feels to be free. Ava told me that she knew how I felt. She had to know. Any black person in America, if they are honest with themselves, have got to come to the conclusion that they don't know what it feels like to be free. We aren't free politically, economically, or socially. 
we have very little power over what happens in our lives. In fact, a black person in America isn't even free to walk down the street. Walk down the wrong street, in the wrong neighborhood at night, and you know what happens. Ava and I got on famously. A lot of times I didn't understand what in the world she was talking about. But at times she made so much sense, I wondered if it was really the world that was crazy. She taught me a lot about prison, and she was forever telling some funny story about her life. Ava was a huge sister. She weighed about 300 pounds. She had very dark skin, and her hair was cut short next to her scalp. People who have accepted white European standards of beauty would find her unattractive. But to me, there was something beautiful about her, and I love to look at her. She is one of the few people that I have met in my life who have the courage to be almost totally honest. Altogether, Ava had spent about 10 years in the Clinton Correctional Facility for Women in New Jersey. She had been there in the old days when the women worked out on the farm. She told me how the women were treated, that state troopers would be called in for the slightest disturbance. She was there during a riot at Clinton and had seen state troopers beat the women mercilessly. Once they had beaten a pregnant woman so badly, she lost her baby. Around this time, I started taking my little walks. Staying cooped up in that cage all day was driving me up the wall. So when the guards brought my food, I would walk past them into what was called the day room, where the women ate and watched TV. I would walk first to one dorm, then to the other, and then return to my cell. There was no place I could run to since there were two or three locked doors between me and the outside. Most of the guards would nag me to come back into my cell and after a short time, I would. But none of them got too crazy about it until one day a guard yelled at me, Get back here. Did you hear me? Get back here. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's being ordered around. And if there's another thing that makes me go wild, it's for a white person to talk to me in that tone of voice. You make me come here, I told her. You so big and bad, I want to see you make me come back in there. She made a move like she was going to grab me. You put your hands on me, and it's going to be you and me. You lay a hand on me, and I'm going to splatter your brains all over these walls. It's a good thing she didn't try me, though, because she outweighed me by at least 50 pounds, and I was still pretty much the one-armed bandit. But I would have given her a hell of a fight. I was mad and frustrated, and I had already stored up about two or three months of anger. Anyway, I finally went back into the cell when I was ready, but her attitude made me defiant. Whenever she opened my cell for anything, I would push past her and walk around for a minute. She would stand in the doorway like she was a door or something, and I would rear back and butt her out of the way. She was as big as a house, but she didn't have one bit of strength. Finally, she called the male guards. I was in one of the dorms talking to the women wondering why she wasn't bothering me, when about ten male guards came into the room. Who is Joanne Chesimard? the head guard asked. Nobody said anything. Which one of you is Joanne Chesimard? They looked like they were ready to leap on somebody. Again, no one responded. All right, I'm going to ask you again. Which one of you is Joanne Chesimard? 
I'm Joanne Chesimard, Ava said. Well, when the guards took one look at Ava and saw how big she was, their tone changed immediately. Miss Chesimard, would you please return to your cell? One of the guards came from the back and tapped the sergeant on the shoulder. I know her, he said. She's not Chesimard. I am who you are looking for, I said. I didn't want Ava to get too involved in my madness. I'll see you sisters later. I've had enough excitement for the moment. I walked past them and went to my cell and opened a book. The next day, the same guard managed to tick me off again. I don't want any more trouble out of you, she said. I don't want to have to call the men again. You can call the National Guard, the militia, the FBI, and anybody else for all I care. You can call your mother if you want to, I told her. As soon as she opened the door for lunch, I pushed her right past her. I took my tray, sat down with the other women, and started eating my lunch. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I wanted to see what they were going to do. I had about three mouthfuls of food left on my plate when the goon squad came in. All right, get up and get in your cell. As soon as I finish what I have on my plate. Now, they ordered. I only have two spoonfuls left. Now, they beckon to the female guard. Remove the prisoner to her cell. She came near me with her hand stretched out. Don't you put your hands on me, I told her. I'll walk to my cell. Remove the prisoner to her cell, they ordered. She went to grab my arm, and all at once the room was in motion. Chairs, tables, cups, trays were flying in the air. Everybody was either running to get out of the way or fighting. The female guard made a wild dash for the door. The male guards jumped on me. I was hitting, kicking, scratching, punching, biting, and I don't know what all else. They finally managed to get me in my cell and the other women locked in their dormitories. None of the women was seriously injured. I had a few nicks and scratches, but other otherwise I was fine. And I felt fine. Some of that anger pent up inside me had been released. One of the guards was wounded. Somehow his face had got cut. He was the same little runt who had sat across from me in the hospital, pointing a shotgun at me and switching the safety on and off, talking about how he liked to kill animals. Nobody knows how he was cut or who cut him, but everybody knows that the hunter got hunted. Later that day, they brought a photographer to photograph the evidence. The local newspaper later reported a riot at the workhouse. Some police and the sheriff came around and searched the jail. They said they were looking for the weapon that had cut the guard. They didn't find anything. That night, they came and got Ava. They took her to the Vroom building, the New Jersey hospital for the criminally insane. She spent about three weeks there before she came back. The night she left, I felt sad and guilty. Here, I had got her caught up in my madness. I was sitting and thinking about her. So I sat down and wrote this poem. Rhinoceros woman, who nobody wants and everybody used. They say you're crazy, cause you not crazy enough to kneel when told to kneel. Hey, big woman, with the scars on the head and scars on the heart that never seem to heal. I saw your light and it was shining. You gave them love, they gave you shit. You gave them you, they gave you Hollywood. 
They purr at you because you know how to roar and back it up with realness. Rhinoceros woman, big mama in a little world, you closed your eyes and neon spun inside your head because it was dark outside. You read your Bible, but God never came. Your daddy would have loved you, but what would the neighbors say? They hate you, mama, because you expose their madness and their cruelty. They can see in your eyes a thousand nightmares that they have made come true. Black woman, bad woman. Wear your bigness on your chest like a badge, cause you done earned it. Strong woman, Amazon, wear your scars like jewelry, cause they were bought with blood. They call you mad, and almost had you believe in that shit. They called you ugly, and you hid yourself behind yourself, and wallowed in their shame. Rhinoceros woman, the world is blind and slight of mind and cannot see how beautiful you are. I saw your light and it was shining. Most of the women benefited from the riot though. Over the next few days, almost everybody was released or sent to some kind of program. The jail was practically empty. It's strange how things work. When it suits the government's interests, they put people in jail for rioting. And when it suits their interests, they let them out of jail for the same thing. Afterward, the outer door to my cage remained shut at all times. This was no great deprivation since it had remained closed most of the time before anyway. One day they brought me a big bushel of stream beans. They grew a lot of their food at the workhouse. The men worked in the fields. Here, we want you to snap these stream beans. How much are you going to pay me, I asked. We don't pay no inmate nothing, but if you snap these beans, we'll let your door stay open while you snap them. I don't work for nothing. I ain't going to be no slave for nobody. Don't you know that slavery was outlawed? No, the guard said. You're wrong. Slavery was outlawed with the exception of prisons. Slavery is legal in prisons. I looked it up, and sure enough, she was right. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution says, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Well, that explained a lot of things. That explained why jails and prisons all over the country are filled to the brim with black and third world people. Why so many black people can't find a job on the streets and are forced to survive the best way they know how. Once you're in prison, there are plenty of jobs. And if you don't want to work, they beat you up and throw you in the hole. If every state had to pay workers to do the jobs prisoners are forced to do, the salaries would amount to billions. License plates alone would amount to millions. When Jimmy Carter was governor of Georgia, he brought a black woman from prison to clean the state house and babysit for Amy. Prisons are profitable business. They are a way of legally perpetuating slavery. In every state, more and more prisons are being built and even more are on the drawing board. Who are they for? 
they certainly aren't planning to put white people in them. Prisons are part of this government's genocidal war against black and third world people. On July 19, 1973, I was taken to New York to be arraigned on a Queens bank robbery incident in Brooklyn Federal Court. The trip was like a surrealistic cartoon. There must have been at least 12 cars in the procession, and a New Jersey state trooper's car was stationed at every exit on the turnpike. All the cars had lights on and sirens going. A helicopter trailed us, and the pigs in the car I was in were comical. At every point, they said something like, at least we got to the turnpike. At least we got to the bridge. At least we got to New York. At least we made it to the court. Whenever they passed a police car, they waved and sometimes raised their fists. When the Jersey police were replaced by New York police at the bridge, to Staten Island, they shook hands and gave each other the power sign. They even called to each other they even called each other brother. This is my brother officer, so and so. They acted like they were on some dangerous mission inside Russia. They acted like they were on some dangerous mission inside Russia. They were actually afraid. White people's fear of black people with guns will never cease to amaze me. Probably it's because they think about what they would do were they in their were they in our place. Especially the police who have done so much dirt to black people. Their guilty conscience tells them to be afraid. When black people seriously organize and take up arms to fight for our liberation, there will be a lot of white people who will drop dead for, from no other reason than their own guilt and fear. In September, I was moved from the workhouse and entombed in the basement of the Middlesex County Jail, allegedly because of the jail's proximity to the Middlesex County Courthouse, where the New Jersey trial was scheduled to begin on October 1st. I was the first and last woman ever imprisoned there. It has always been a men's jail. When I arrived, I was given a dirty, scratchy horse blanket and one sheet. Thinking they had made a mistake, I asked for another sheet. That's all you get, they told me. I can't sleep with that filthy thing over me. I need another sheet. Sorry. Why am I allowed only one sheet? That's all the men get. We only give one because they might hang themselves. They can hang themselves as easily with one sheet as they can with two, I reasoned. Sorry. For me to sleep on that filthy thing with one sheet was out of the question. I hooped, hollered, demanded they call my lawyer and told the guard that the next time she came into my cage, I was going to wrap the sheet around her neck. Finally, she gave me another sheet. If I wrote a hundred pages describing the basement of the Middlesex County Jail, it would be impossible for you to visualize it. It was a big, grayish, pukey, greenish cell. The ceiling was covered with all kinds of pipes, some small, some huge, some dry, some leaky. There was no natural light, and the jailers refused to open the small windows located near the ceiling. The average temperature was 95 degrees. It was infested with ants and centipedes. I had never seen a centipede before, and they scared me to death. They were huge albino monsters, and they crawled all over me. Female guards were stationed at the door of my cell, 
24 hours a day. Their job was to sit there and look in the cell at me. They could see every move I made. The first day I moved the bed against the wall, away from the guard's surveillance so that I could have a little privacy when I was sleeping. The guards ordered me to move the bed into the middle of the floor. I refused. The next day, workmen nailed the bed to the floor in the center of the cell. They even peeked through the window in the bathroom when I was on the toilet or taking a shower. When I covered the peephole with a towel or a uniform, they ordered me to remove it and threatened to take away all towels and uniforms if I continued covering the window. I didn't refuse. I simply ignored them. After a while, they gave up. A month later, one of the surgeons a month later, one of the sergeants told me that I was permitted to cover the window when I used the bathroom, but only for three minutes. There were 12 four-foot-long fluorescent light bulbs in the cage that were blinding. When I got ready to go to sleep the first night, I asked the guard to turn off the lights. She refused. I can't see you if the light isn't on. How in the world can you miss me? You can see everything in the cell. Sorry. They kept me under those blinding lights for days. I felt like I was going blind. I was seeing everything in doubles and triples. When Evelyn, my lawyer, came to see me, I complained. Finally, after Evelyn accused them of torture, they turned the lights off at 11. But every 10 or 15 minutes, they would shine a huge floodlight into the cell. Then the trial started. First, motions were argued. Practically all of our motions were denied. All the prosecutions, all the prosecutions were granted. Then jury selection began before Judge John E. Bachman. When they brought in the first jury panel, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. There were only a few black speckles here and there, and the panel looked more like a lynch mob than a jury. Most of the jurors openly glared at us, as if they would kill us if they could. Half said they thought we were guilty. The other half, although they didn't say it right out, answered questions like they believed more or less that we probably were guilty. I was convinced some of them deliberately lied just to get on the jury and convict us. Most of the few black people excused themselves on the grounds of hardship. They had children, families, jobs, and simply could not afford to be on a lengthy jury trial. If ever there was a case of the blues, I had it. Do something, I kept telling the lawyers. Do something. What can we do, the lawyers would answer. We're doing the best we can. It was true, but I just could not accept it. This was my life they were talking about. I must have bugged the lawyers to death. Object to this. Object to that, I would tell them. Our objection is already on the record. We'll object again anyway. I was outraged, trapped, and helpless. Whenever a juror said something that revealed out and out prejudice, the judge would try and to clean it up. Poor Ray Brown, one of the defense lawyers, caught most of my fire. I want you to object. On what basis, he would ask. Don't you see it? The judge is asking leading questions. But the judge is legally allowed to ask leading questions during jury selection. Well, object anyway. I knew nothing about law then. I had never even seen a trial. I just couldn't understand how the judge could be so blatantly prejudiced I just couldn't understand how the judge could be so blatantly prejudiced in favor of the prosecution 
and there was nothing we could do about it. Why can't y'all be like Perry Mason? I asked the lawyers jokingly. Did you ever see Perry Mason defend a black defendant? Ray Brown answered. Sundiata was a lifesaver. He would try to calm me down and would explain what to expect. Logically, I accepted what he said, but I was still frantic. We just can't let ourselves be railroaded, I say, coming up with one wild idea after another. Sandiata would patiently explain why none of my fantastic ideas would work. After a while of participating in my own legal lynching, I became convinced that Sandiata and I should fire the lawyers and defend ourselves. In that way, we wouldn't be tied to those stupid rules and we could say anything we wanted to. That's not true, Sandiata told me. Even if you defend yourself, even if you defend yourself, you're still bound by their rules. How am I supposed to know those rules? I'm not a lawyer, and I still have a constitutional right to defend myself. True, but you still have to play accordingly to their rules, or they can bind and gag you. Look at what they did to Bobby Seale. Every time I looked up at the jury box, I'd argue the point again but I also knew that I didn't know one thing about the law, and it was hard to picture myself actually defending myself. Evelyn was always repeating the old cliche that a person who defends himself has a fool for a lawyer. As we came closer and closer to completing the selection of the jury, I became more and more upset. Then, one day, a kid who couldn't have been more than 20 was being examined as a potential juror. He spilled the beans. The judge asked him if he had an opinion of the case, and he said, They say she's guilty. The judge questioned him further, and he blurted it all out. The prospective jurors in the jury room were talking about the case, although they had been ordered not to discuss it. The judge asked what they were saying. They say she's guilty. Only Mrs. Chesimard, the judge asked. They're saying they're black. They're guilty. At that moment, the lawyers were all on their feet, talking a mile a minute. They demanded a complete investigation of what was going on in the jury room. They wanted the juror asked more questions. They wanted the jurors to whom he talked questioned. The judge immediately realized the boy had opened a can of worms. He did everything he could to avoid opening the can any further, but it had gotten out of his control. He finally agreed to conduct an impartial investigation. This time, when he questioned the jurors, he was very careful to downplay the gravity of what was, of what was going on in the jury room, but the other jurors substantiated what the boy had said. Our lawyers filed a motion asking the jury be selected from another county because we couldn't get a fair trial in Middlesex. The assignment judge, not Judge Bachman, was to decide the motion. Meanwhile, the trial was stopped. Evelyn told me the decision. The assignment judge had determined that it was in fact true that we couldn't get a fair trial in Middlesex County. The jury was to be picked from Morris County. Where's that? I asked Evelyn. She said she hadn't the faintest idea. Then Ray Brown came in. Where in the world is Morris County? I asked him. Well, he said, I'll tell you. Morris County was almost completely white with very few black people and even fewer Hispanics and Asians. What does that mean? Are there 10% black people? 5% or what? A whole lot fewer. A jury of your peers, Evelyn said bitterly. What can we do, I asked. We'll just have to wait and see. Can't we get the trial moved somewhere else where there are more black people? We can try, but don't get your hopes up too high. 
I was coming back to Earth and fast. The trial had been postponed for about a month until January because they needed time to secure the jail in Morristown in Morris County. Maybe, I thought, the lawyers will come up with something by then. I really didn't expect too much, but it seemed like such an obvious trick, such an obvious ploy to ensure that we didn't receive a fair trial by a jury of our peers, that I thought maybe something could be done about it. I was naive in those days. I knew it in theory, but I had not seen enough to accept the fact that there was absolutely no justice whatsoever for black people in America. I still had some hope left, but they had taken something that was supposed to help us and turned it against us. They had used the law to abuse the law. Now, all we have to do, I reasoned, is get the facts and figures and prove that they are trying to deny us fair trial. How little did I know 